talk about the National Water Quality Assessment Program, and part of a component of that is our agricultural chemical transport study. This is a study looking at the effects of agriculture on water quality at seven different sites across the country. And today, specifically, though, we're going to be talking about uh, an area in northwest Mississippi, our Mississippi alluvial plain, is commonly referred to as the Delta. And we're going to talk to some farmers, we're going to talk to some scientists, and we're going to take a little bit of a tour of the Delta. So Richard, what have you been working on as far as the NACWA program? Well, for the last couple of years, I've uh, helped out with uh, sparrow modeling that the NACWA program is uh, doing. I, the team that I worked with helped develop a sparrow model for total nitrogen and total phosphorus for the South Central United States. So what does a sparrow model do? And it relates uh, water quality information that we collect in the field to landscape characteristics, sources of a particular pollutant, and it also relates it to those things that deliver those pollutants to a receiving stream. And so what would be the most important results or the most significant results that you found from this study? The one thing that I thought was really interesting was how much of the nitrogen load was contributed by atmospheric deposition. It was greater than 40 percent. And so with the other sources of nitrogen and phosphorus, the higher sources came from the agricultural industry from fertilizer and manure inputs. So, Does this relate to the Gulf hypoxia zone at all? Yes, it would have a pretty good uh, effect there. Uh, uh, the, the hypoxia zone, in a, you know, recent studies are, are pointing toward nutrients as the reasons. And so where in the uh, southern part of the United States are areas that contribute to the uh, hypoxia zone, and we're able to see this as we map the loads for our particular study area. Okay, so great. that was the other thing that we did. Great, so. thanks. Heather, what part of the agricultural chemical transport study have you really uh, found to be interesting? Um, I think it was more of a spinoff from that project. It was um, we started looking or we were asked to see if we could use the data that we had collected to see if the Biofuels Initiative had any impact on water quality and quantity in the Mississippi Delta. So what was the Biofuels Initiative? Well, it was implemented by Congress in 2006 and it was the push, you know, to make gasoline what, use up to 15% of it needed to be ethanol. and in America, it's corn-based ethanol. Um, and so we were able to see that between 2006 and 2007, there was a large conversion from cotton in the Delta. Over 450,000 acres were converted from cotton to corn the following year in 2007. So um, what, were, what were the significant results from this uh, study? So the results were we found that um, in that switch from 2006 to 2007, uh, we increased, I guess, the loss of storage in the aquifer in the year 2007. We used more water than we would have used had it been in cotton um, like the year before. Um, also, we, uh, using the Sparrow model, uh, saw that we could be increasing the amount of nitrogen yield moving from the Yazoo River Basin into the Mississippi River and then on down to the Gulf of Mexico. Thanks. So what is the most interesting thing that you've worked on um, in the Delta as well, part of the ACT study? I've been working on uh, fate and transport of glyphosate. Glyphosate is a non-selective herbicide used in the United States for crop production. It's been used since the uh, early 1970s, but it really took off in uh, the early 1990s when genetically modified crops, specifically corn, cotton, and uh, soybean, were modified to so that you could use glyphosate over the top of them for weed control. And then the amount of glyphosate being used has just uh, jumped up enormously. There hasn't been a lot of work on the fate and transfer of glyphosate because it's very difficult to analyze for and very expensive. But we were able to do a two-year study at two different locations, one in Iowa, one in Mississippi, looking at multiple size basins, looking at the, how the fate and transport of glyphosate changed 
as you moved in different uh, agricultural and climatic areas. And we were able to sort of relate the occurrence of glyphosate to three different factors, one being use, if you, which makes sense. If you use it, if you use more of it, you're gonna see more of it. And of course in Mississippi, because of our warmer climates and our, and our hardier weeds, we probably used more than they did in Iowa, so we saw more. Additionally, we saw it was related to hydrology or precipitation rainfall. You need water to move uh, agricultural chemicals off the fields. And so in areas where they have more runoff, then uh, you'll see more glyphosate. And then the third factor was sort of the flow path or the route of the water as it moves off the field and into the stream. Does it go through the ground or does it go through uh, over the top of the mm -hmm. landscape? And this makes a difference because glyphosate has a, a high affinity for absorption to soil particles. And if it goes through the ground, it has a tendency to absorb more. And so you'll see less glyphosate in your stream mm -hmm. if the water gets there through the soil. That's been a very interesting study and has been quite well received. So Jeannie, tell us a little bit about what you've been doing for the uh, agricultural chemical transport study. So I've been working on the role of groundwater surface water exchange on the transport of agricultural chemicals in the Beaufort Basin. And, and why is this important to study? Well, Actually, at first, we thought it wasn't important to study. Um, we've sampled the groundwater uh, in the Delta extensively and have never found much of any agricultural chemicals in the groundwater. And so the assumption was that there was very little interaction between the surface water and the groundwater since the surface water always had agricultural chemicals in it of some form. Um, but uh, what we found is that actually it's, it's not the hydrology that's preventing the exchange of groundwater surface water, it's the chemistry of our groundwater system. Um, and so, for example, in our study area, uh, we found that we actually were in connection with the aquifer and we were generally um, gaining and losing, so the movement of water both ways, um, but it was the chemistry within the stream bed and the aquifer that was actually causing um, nitrogen, this example, to be reduced to N2. And so and what is the so what are the major conclusions that you found from the study? We find that we have huge swings in both the direction of uh, the movement of water between um, the groundwater and surface water um, and also that this has a um, fairly large impact on the chemistry of surface water um, and could have impact on what we're finding in the ground. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Clara, what have you been working on as far as part of the uh, agricultural chemical transport study? I've been working on a, a paper regarding metolachlor movement throughout the environment. Metolachlor is an organic chemical that's applied, it's an herbicide, so it is usually applied before they plant, it's pre-emergent. And where are you, where is the study area that you're looking at for this? So you have pretty good coverage of the United States. You have the Mississippi, California, and the San Joaquin Valley. We have a study in Maryland, and we have a couple in the Midwest. So we have Indiana, Nebraska, and all these areas that we were studying are agricultural areas. So we wanted to understand how the agricultural chemicals that are applied to, to increase the productivity of crops move throughout the environment after they're applied, where do they go, and basically have a good idea of what's going on across the, across the U.S. So what would be the most significant results you found so far? I found that it's really interesting that a lot of the areas have similar um, similar allocations of metolachlor and its degradates throughout the seven environmental compartments. But where you, where you apply metolachlor, where it's used, you are going to find it, or its degradates, and you're going to find them in every single environmental compartment through which water flows. So that's that's an important thing to, to, to keep in mind about about chemicals in the environment. That's great. Thank you. Thank you.